Once upon a time, we had perfect vision. In fact, it was a little better than perfect. We know because throughout grade school, we were regularly tested every year by a team of keen ophthalmologists eager to find those of us who needed their services. Or were they optometrists or opticians? What's the difference anyway? Well, your basic ophthalmologist has been to medical school first and then later served a year as an intern, followed by a three-year residency focusing on their specialty. And anything your eye needs, from glaucoma treatment to corrective surgery to your basic eye exam, they can do. The optometrist goes to college, then spends a further four years in a professional program that gives them a Doctor of Optometry degree. They perform basic eye exams, treat your near or farsightedness, prescribe glasses, and diagnose problems of the eye. So, no surgery. An optician does none of these things. All they get to do is prepare and fit you for glasses and do other things related to your glasses. They can't even do the basic exam to see what prescription you need. They get a one or two year degree to do what they do and that's it. Nothing wrong with being an optician, but if your eyes need something beyond a prescription for a pair of glasses filled, don't start at the optician. Anyway, it was probably some combination of optometrists and ophthalmologists, whose root word, ophthalmo, just means eye in Greek, who volunteered to work together to perform those grade school tests on us and to make sure we could all see straight, which we could, quite well, for many, many years. So many years, in fact, that we basically stopped worrying about it as we got older. And we were proud of it, too. Our parents needed glasses, our younger brother needed glasses, and a bunch of our friends over the years needed glasses, but not us. Our vision had been pronounced perfect so many times that it was obvious it would always be so. Often we would have a bit of fun, in which we would borrow someone's glasses and try them on just to see how weirdly distorted our view of the world would be and to marvel at how imperfect the eyes of others were. Some were nearsighted, some farsighted, and we boggled at the blurry images and confusing depth changes produced from a variety of different prescriptions. Undoubtedly, some of you, even those of you who already wear glasses, have tried on someone else's pair just to see what the differences are. And no doubt you've also felt secretly pleased that at least your vision isn't as bad as theirs on more than one occasion. And this was all well and good and proper and right. We were smugly vision perfect, while the rest of the world was mostly in need of some sort of prosthetic to help them see properly. Never once did we suffer the embarrassment of searching for our eyes while they were snugly affixed to the tops of our heads. It just didn't happen. And then one day, decades after our last serious eye test, we decided, wouldn't it be funny if we tried on the glasses of one of the kids we were working with? See, he'd just gone in for an eye test, and it had been decided he needed glasses. So naturally, once they came in, we just had to try them on to see how goofed up his vision was compared to ours. And a strange thing happened when we did. Suddenly, we could see the individual leaves on a tree across the yard, something we hadn't been aware we couldn't see up until then. We knew the tree was there, of course, and our brain knew trees had leaves, of course, and it had just sort of done the work of assuring us that the tree had the right sort of leaves in the right sort of places, and we could see them just fine, thanks for checking. Because we had perfect vision, you see. Except we didn't anymore, and probably hadn't for many years. Turns out, we'd really been making a spectacle of ourselves. This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. One of the unfortunate facts of life is that as you get older, your eyesight gets worse. We can tell because we've just had to clean our reading glasses for the third time to get this far into the episode. Mostly, this is because as we get older, our various bits and pieces just stop working as well as they did in our youth. Parts wear out and become less elastic than they once were meaning things that see a lot of use have seen a lot of use. 
The natural lens of the eye thickens and becomes less flexible and less able to focus on nearby objects. This is called presbyopia and happens whether you are near or farsighted. By your mid-40s, it's a downhill struggle to see things clearly anymore, even if you did start with perfect vision. Add in complications from medical conditions, near and far sightedness, what you've had to eat and drink, and even daily fluctuations in things like blood pressure and the vitreous fluid that makes up four-fifths of the volume of your eyes, and you can begin to see why it's so hard to see as you get older. This is particularly a problem if you happen to be a monk in charge of reading, interpreting, and copying important ancient texts. You've really got a lot working against you. Not only were the texts often in a foreign language, which presented problems all on its own, you were often obliged to read them off the oldest materials written in the poorest hands using some of the worst inks going. You really had to get a good squint on to see faded out iron gall ink written on a thrice scraped palimpsest by a guy who was trying to cram anti-disestablishmentarianism into half an inch of space at the end of the last line so he didn't have to start an entirely new page and whose eyesight was just as bad as yours was about to be. And remember, you were only doing this in good light if it happened to be the middle of a cloudless summer day and you had a window seat. Most of the rest of the time you were working with a guttering candle or oil lamp casting a dim yellow light over everything. In short, your eyes were constantly straining to see what you were reading and writing, which, as any mother can tell you, is a great way to ruin your eyesight at an early age. Under these circumstances, your useful life as a copyist was pretty short, limited to just a few years from the time you entered into service until it was time to put you out to pasture because you couldn't see anything anymore. What you needed was some way to assist your poor eyes that would reduce the strain and keep you working longer. One of the earliest methods used was to take a glass globe filled with water and roll it across a page line by line. The globe and water worked as a magnifying lens, making the text directly under it bigger and somewhat easier to read. Of course, this only worked on text directly opposite the portion of the globe you were looking into and terribly distorted everything else around it. But at least you had a slightly easier time seeing a few letters as you rolled it along. It's tedious and slow, what with having to wait for the water to settle each time the globe moved, but at least it was something. Of course, if the globe broke or leaked, you got the privilege of starting all over again as the water washed all the ink off your very important documents and ruined the manuscripts you were copying. As an extra bonus, if you left the glass globe full of water sitting on the windowsill so as not to allow it to drip all over your work and the sun came out, you stood a pretty good chance of lighting all the paper on the desk on fire and starting all over again anyway. You can tell this was a great solution because Pliny the Elder makes a point of mentioning this in his natural history and he was hardly ever wrong about anything except maybe how to escape from volcanoes. See our episode. But all was not lost. The globe of water really was a good idea. It just wasn't the idea they thought it was. 4,600 years ago, the Egyptians made the most of it by doing away with much of the globe and just retaining a small section of it in order to make the first known convex lenses. Except theirs were made out of rock crystal and turned up as the eyes on some of their statues. It works like this. Take as near as you can get to a perfect sphere of rock crystal. Yes, you'll probably have to work a while smoothing and shaping it, and please do try to choose a piece with as few imperfections in it as you can to start with, and cut or shear off a thin piece of it straight through near one edge. If you've done it right, you end up with a slice of rock crystal flat on one side and rounded on the other. This then becomes a lens whose rounded side is convex. A little additional smoothing and shaping and you have something that, like the Egyptian statue eyes, was a good place to start making reading lenses. And once you've learned how to do that, it's easy enough to work out how to make concave lenses where the curved side curves into the material you're using instead of away from it. It's just a shame the Egyptians never wrote down how they did it all so precisely, and the skill disappeared for, well, more years than we can count. Although, it's a little unfair to blame the Egyptians entirely for the loss, because in the Bronze Age, people were already making quartz and glass convex lenses with 1.5 or 2 times magnification, good enough to read with. They don't appear to have passed on the info either. 
Eventually, the Greeks and Romans went through the whole process again and learned how to make their own lenses, but there was one key difference. This time, they wrote the instructions down where other people could find them. When their time at the top of the heap ran out, others were able to pick up the skills and continue making lenses. Which is why, somewhere around 1000 CE, someone made reading stones. See, one of the things you can do with a convex lens is lay it down on a piece of writing and make the words bigger. It's the same trick as the water globe, except it works better, is less of a hassle because it isn't full of water, doesn't roll away every time you let go of it, and can be made in a variety of different magnifications depending on how much of an improvement you want. On Gotland Island in Sweden, ten such lenses made from extremely pure rock crystal turned up. The Visby lenses, as they are called, are said to have optical properties so good that some speculate at least two of the ten would have been capable of making an early 11th or 12th century telescope. The thing is, though, there wasn't a huge demand for these reading stones. There were two reasons for this. One was that only a limited number of people needed to read and write so often as to make them necessary. The second was, once you had one, you were unlikely to need another. You could just take the one you had wherever you needed it to be and use it. There simply wasn't enough demand to make it worth anyone's time to get really good at making them and so advance the art of lens making. And then, in the 12th and 13th centuries, Christian churches suddenly became very interested in relics. For a whole bunch of reasons, which we may get into in a future episode, any church that was worth going to, and therefore giving money to, had to have at least one relic. And it was very important that churches be able to attract and collect money from as many people as possible. So the more, and more important, relics they had, the better off they were. Keep the people coming in the doors, and the money going into the coffers. The problem was, so many churches suddenly wanted so many relics that they started to become hard to come by. And you might be tempted to think that there was only a finite amount of saints' finger bones and pieces of the true cross to go around. Not so. Especially not so if you can cut them small enough. Which many, many suppliers of religious relics suddenly found they could do. But that made them rather hard to see, especially to the public, which was the whole point of the thing. Never having heard of flea circuses, it became obvious that if Joe Peasant couldn't see the very important relic from the Last Supper, Joe Peasant wasn't going to part with his hard-won coin. Something had to be done. The obvious solution was to permanently affix a reading stone to the relic's container. Then, by peering into the stone, you could quite clearly see the thin sliver of wood or minute fragment of antler claiming to be holy religious relics. Of course, now you had to have enough reading stones to go around, which meant you had to have enough people who knew how to make them, and that could keep making them, to go around. Now, there was enough demand to make lens making a going concern, encouraging people to develop the skills needed and advance the art. In addition to the new demand, new and interesting polished stones and jewels were making their way back into Europe from the Crusades. Many of them were of such clarity and quality that monks in Europe began to polish them into reading stones of their own, especially after discovering that the flatter curvature of some of the cut stones made much better reading aids and used less stone to do it. This made them lighter and easier to use. Which is why someone eventually got the idea that, instead of holding the reading stone on the page and having to move it around in order to read, it was much easier to hold the new stones in front of the eye and read through them that way. Much more of the page could be seen clearly at one time, which allowed the work to be done more quickly. The problem was, these new wood frame mounted lenses only came as singles and had to be held in front of the eye by hand. No one had worked out how to make two identical lenses. Two different stones were needed in order to have two lenses, and no two stones were alike, so no two lenses, which had to be worked individually, came out with the same curvature and clarity. You just couldn't make them match with the equipment available at the time. Enter the Italians. By the 1300s, they'd been quite busy sailing around the Mediterranean trading with whomever they could. When they sailed into Egypt and traded for some natron, they knew they were onto something, but hadn't worked out exactly what yet. Natron is a naturally occurring mix of soda ash and baking soda, and the Egyptians had been using it for ages and ages to preserve their dead. 
but since the Venetians who traded for it didn't really treat their dead the same way, they probably didn't have much use for it yet, but they were confident they could come up with something. And they did. They discovered you could use natron during the glass making process to make glass melt at a lower temperature, which meant the glass was even more liquid than usual at high temperature which meant they could make smoother glass, less filled with imperfections and bubbles, and without the slight colored tinge you sometimes got from other minerals in the glass. In short, it was the best glass anyone had ever seen, and the Venetians began churning it out, calling it crystallum, crystal glass, and it became the glass to have, bar none. Of course, once you have glass that good, there's only one thing to do. That's right, you blow bubbles with it. Perfectly round, perfectly clear bubbles. And then, perhaps at the request of a nearby Italian monk, you slice off a bit of the glass bubble, just like you did with the polished rock crystals ages ago, to make a lens. Except, since the whole glass bubble was of a uniform quality and clarity, you could cut two lenses at the same time from the same piece and polish them both up to the same curvature. Which meant you could have proper glasses at last which every monk wanted and proved to be such a boon to the spectacle-making business that in London alone in the 1380s, 380 crystal glass spectacles were being imported each month between July and the end of September. There was solid demand for them throughout Europe, even though they were just two glass lenses in a solid wooden frame that had to be held to the face by hand. Then, in 1440, a man named Johann Gutenberg did the thing you know he did, and suddenly, with all the new reading material running around, every Tom, Dick, and Harry wanted to be able to participate. Soon, glasses were being mass-produced and made available to the general public. And the general public soon discovered that having to hold your glasses up all the time can, as you might imagine, be somewhat inconvenient. Among the first innovations was the rivet spectacle, a frame held together by a rivet which could then grip the nose. Other attempts to keep the new spectacles hands-free included a ribbon tied over the head and held in place by a hat, and a similar arrangement where ribbons were tied at the back of the head to wear the frames like a mask. It wasn't until the 1700s that someone, probably British optician Edward Scarlett, proposed the over-the-ear arrangement we know today, though at the time it proved unpopular. Instead, people opted to attach long handles to their glasses so that even if they had to hold the glasses up to their eyes, they could at least look relaxed doing so. And then, curiously, in the latter part of the 18th century, a lot of people took a giant step backward and started wearing monocles, a lens over just one eye. They first developed from the quizzing glass, a single lens held up in front of the eye on a long stick, just as spectacles were. So named, we presume, because it was used whenever someone wanted to give the appearance of examining something closely. The monocle was attached to a string, which was in turn attached to clothing to avoid losing it. Most were custom fitted, and contrary to popular belief, rarely fell out once properly placed. Three styles were available, one which was just the glass itself, one with the glass held in a frame designed to fit the eye and hold the monocle away from the lashes, and one that used a spring-loaded mechanism to secure it in place. Reportedly, properly fitted monocles were comfortable and best used to closely examine something in detail rather than as a general corrective lens. Lorgnettes were spectacles held on a shorter rod, and you'll recognize them as the sort of glasses that seem supremely ineffective when worn by elderly women at the opera in older movies. They gained popularity in the late 19th century and were more of a fashionable piece of jewelry than actual useful glasses. The Passenay are, of course, every steampunk fan's choice for fashionably outdated eyewear. Two lenses are set in a metal or plastic frame designed to pinch the bridge of the nose, holding them in place. Basically an advancement on the rivet spectacles, they were first used in Europe in the late 14th century, then fell out of fashion before falling back into fashion in the 1840s, then back out of fashion again before never really falling back into fashion except among the cosplay crowd. And for those who require an even more obscure option for their eyewear, consider the scissors glasses, which are held together by a hinge in the middle and placed in front of the eyes with a frame held beneath the nose by hand or mounted on a stick. We can't wait for those to come back in style. Of course, there have been a lot of other developments on your basic pair of spectacles over the years, from Benjamin Franklin's invention of the bifocal to the advent of contact lenses. 
But really, we've already learned our lesson about taking spectacles for granted now that we have to wear them too. These days, we've come to grips with our glasses wearing selves and have grown accustomed to the strange prosthetic that hangs before our eyes most days. We've gained an appreciation for them and for the many benefits they've bestowed not just on us, but on the world as a whole from medieval times to today. And thankfully, since we stopped working with children, no one calls us four eyes anymore. This has, we hope, been another entertaining episode of GM Word of the Week. Thanks for listening, and perhaps presumptuously, thanks for subscribing. It's very kind of you. Many thanks go out to our patrons on Patreon, without whom there would be no show. If you'd like to join their ranks, just head over to our website at gmwordoftheweek.com, find the yellow banner at the top, and give it a click. Easiest thing in the world, really. And we certainly appreciate your support, no matter how big or small you might think it is. If Patreon and consistent ongoing pledges aren't your thing, or lay just a bit beyond your means, that's cool too. Telling your friends about us is also an acceptable contribution, as well as saying a few kind words wherever you can. This week's episode has once again been informed by John W. Farrell's book, The Clock and the Camshaft, and other medieval inventions we still can't live without, which you will find an Amazon link to in the episode's description. Using that link gives us a tiny bit of money, should you choose to purchase said book yourself. This episode was researched, written, and produced by Brian, I can see, Casey. Music was provided by Blue Dot Sessions and Epidemic Sound. A pair of powerful spectacles has sometimes sufficed to cure a person in love.